Hello and welcome to today's webinar. We have a great presentation lined up for you today, but before we get started, we have a few general admin points to cover. First and foremost, please use the online question tool to post any questions that you have and we will share them with our speakers. Second, if you experience any technical difficulties today, please let us know in that same question tool and we will do our best to resolve them. And finally, just to note, the recording of this session and accompanying slides will be shared via email in the coming days. So, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you for attending um, Cedar's session on mediating commercial disputes. I'm Laura McCurl. I'm the Director of Commercial Disputes at Cedar. I oversee our dispute resolution services relating to civil and commercial work, essentially. I'm a, I'm a qualified lawyer, having practiced uh, most of my career in London, uh, but I'm qualified in England and Wales, as well as New York. Um, and CEDAR, as you, you may or may not know, have a number of dispute resolution services which we, we provide, so adjudication, appointment of arbitrators, um, early neutral evaluation, um, expert determination, and what we're here to talk about today and what we're probably best known for, which is mediation. I'm now going to ask our speaker, our other speakers who I'm joined with today uh, to introduce themselves. So Eve, would you like to, to introduce yourself? Thank you, Lauren. Yes. Um, good afternoon. Good morning, everybody, wherever you are. Um, uh, my name is Eve Pienaar. I'm a solicitor by background um, and I've worked in-house, including for some of the reg regulators in the property industry, like Rix and Reba. Um, I now work full time as a mediator and I uh, specialize in construction, um, professional negligence of property and sort of general commercial disputes. I really look, look forward to working with you today. Thank you, Eve. And Stephen? Hi, I'm Steve Barker. Um, I've been mediating for uh, many years. Um, I started out um, life as a solicitor uh, like uh, Eve and um, and then for, for some reason I took the leap to become a barrister um, and I practiced at 45 Gracie Square in, uh, in London but my main work by a long chalk is mediation and um, I'm on the uh, Cedar Chambers uh, panel and uh, uh, I mediate a wide range of disputes mainly commercial reflecting my background as a commercial lawyer um, and property is disputes written all over it and um, I think if the property market were the only area of work we still would be uh, very busy mediating them so I'm looking forward to this today. Great thank you Stephen. Now before we get started we were going to take a poll just so that we can get a, a really good feel as to your level as to your experience of mediation um, so can I ask that we move to the poll if you could please select one um, and then it will it will show us where we sit. Okay, great. So we can see that we have um, that most people who are attending have have had quite a bit of experience of mediation, um, having attended at least three, um, and many attending kind of between four or ten or more. Um, so that's great. Uh, and so we'll we'll kind of make sure that we bear that in mind as we're talking. But for those of you who've never attended a mediation, this still should be very very accessible, and and hopefully you'll learn a lot today. Great. If we could just move to the the next slide, great. So this is what we're going to cover uh, as a quick trot through of, of kind of the agenda for today. Um, we're going to cover a brief overview of the mediation process uh, to re-familiarize those who, who are very experienced in attending mediations, but also to give everyone a, a baseline. We're going to look at the advantages of mediation. We're going to look at managing stakeholders, in particular in, in commercial property disputes, so looking at kind of the key players and, and people that you'll need to consider. We're going to look at key areas of dispute and we're also going to look at recent developments in mediation because there's been a lot that has happened in particular over the last 12 months. And then finally, we hope to have some time to answer some questions for you. At, as mentioned at the start, if you have any questions that pop up, please put them in the chat and then we can deal with them in that section. So that's great. So over to you, Eve. And next slide. Thank you, Lauren. Um, 
So just a brief overview of the mediation process, um, I suppose, essentially in sort of in, in the UK. Um, just a reminder that the mediation is very much about putting the parties at the centre of the process. Um, and what the mediator does is help the parties move from positional bargaining to interest based negotiation. And the way we approach it, this is sort of the, the classic model of mediation. Um, quite a lot of time is spent preparing for the mediation. And what I would say to that is since the pandemic with mediation is moving online, that preparation stage has really taken on a whole new emphasis. Um, we tend to meet the, the parties with their clients ahead of time on Zoom. So we have really rich preparation meetings with them, which means we can hit the ground running when we come to the mediation proper. Uh, the preparation is also about ensuring that we've got the right people, the right tools at the mediation, and that the, the process is arranged um, according to the needs of the parties. And, and in commercial property, that might include site visits or other creative means of, of uh, getting ready for the day. Then when you come to the mediation day, um, you will have a short, typically there will be a short meeting with, um, the, in private session with each party. Uh, there may be more than two parties, but let's pretend it's just two parties to make it easier. Um, when the parties are ready, we then move to a joint session if the parties agree to do so. Um, those are usually very, very helpful because they enable the parties to sort of lay out their stall, explain what they're looking for for the day um, and how they, they, they propose to approach that. The mediator helps that um, opening by defining an, an agenda. When we know what, the, what we have to deal with on the day, the parties then move back to their separate private rooms and the mediator tends to shuttle between the rooms. During the day, we then have the exploration stage, which is where we try and understand and explore the different issues which, which the parties have brought to the table. Um, and that can take some time and different iterations. The mediator might choose to bring the lawyers together or might bring the principals together towards the end. Um, whatever, whatever works to help the parties make progress on the day. Um, once the parties really understand where each side is coming from and have, have clarified any uh, assumptions and other, you move into the bargaining stage, which is later in the day typically, which is when offers start to be made. Um, what we're seeing is that parties and their representatives are, well, the representatives in particular, are very experienced with mediation now and really tend to use it very much to the full. We used to have parties not willing to put offers forward until four o'clock in the afternoon. I find that actually that's really changed and the parties tend to understand that there's still a lot of work to be done after the offers have commenced and therefore are more willing to sort of start, start that dance if you want. During the bargaining stage, we might go back into exploration for certain of the themes which perhaps are um, kicking up new issues, um, but eventually the idea is to reach a commercial settlement which is reduced in writing and signed by the parties. And the reason this process is so successful is because it's both confidential, it's confidential in the private sessions, but the whole day is confidential. The parties can't take what is shared during the mediation and used outside, but it's also all without prejudice. So no one is held to anything until it's all agreed, reduced in writing, signed, and that remains the record of, of the day. Um, I, think that the, uh, I think we've got another poll, uh, Lauren. Great, so this, this is about to pop up on your screen and it is, we wanted to just know what areas of interest do your clients tend to have disputes in? So you can pick multiple uh, options here. Okay, great. So that, that was really helpful. And we're going to come back onto these areas later on, but we can see that from the poll, which is, is great, is that there's a significant uh, amount of disputes on the breach of contract, breach of deed side um, as, a, as an issue, um, but that all of them have, have quite a bit. So that's great. So we'll just proceed to the next slide and I'm going to hand back to Stephen. It's about I remember the first time in a while to turn on my microphone so um right you've already touched on um the confidentiality um being one of the 
the cornerstones and of, of the success for mediation i'm just going to talk about why i think actually um, that whole aspect of mediation is the reason mediation is so much more productive in getting to a settlement than for example having a um, lawyer to lawyer negotiation or clients getting around the table the confidentiality i think splits into the three levels and um, the, the first level um, obviously it's confidential from the outside world um, that for me is is a uh, important not simply because it's going to be reported in um, in uh, in papers and things on a personal level a lot of individuals um, involved in disputes um, find themselves making this the story of their lives and so I actually think the fact that this is not going to be somebody's, this is not going to be gossip or entertainment for third parties actually is really beneficial to people having a clear head to getting to a settlement. The second layer is without, without prejudice from the um, the court, confidential from the court as I uh, like to call it. This means that actually parties can be really experimental. Um, you know, you can make an offer in a mediation that has no binding effect to see whether or not it's possible to settle. Um, and my experience is that people um, do perhaps push the boundaries much more in this environment because they know it's not going to come back to the court. There's nothing we can, uh, you know, we can't be called as a witness to say what happened or what was about to happen or whether a party was to blame. And I think, again, that is a liberator for parties once they get used to the idea that they can actually really be experimental. The third layer of confidentiality is, for me, the real linchpin. It's that when the mediator is with a party in a private session, whether that's in an online breakout room or face-to-face, -face, everything in that room is confidential. The same thing happens when he's in the um, meeting room with the other party. And I think the thing that sometimes people don't understand seen from a mediator's eyes what i'm doing is i'm trying to find out what is going to make this deal happen i'm trying to look for the barriers in the dispute when i'm in each room i'm picking up information and vibes about where a settlement lies and that is the thing i think the fact that people start to trust you to tell you the whole picture that you're effectively sitting on a wall looking over both sides and seeing the whole picture and i think that gives a mediator a unique um, a very privileged role to be able to really understand what's going to settle the dispute. And for me, once people get to really talk to you about what they want and that what they need and what they can't have, then that's when they trust that you're going to keep that to yourself. That is the that is the key to getting to a deal. Um, I, I think we all know now uh, mediation can happen at any stage. And I think increasingly I'm seeing mediation early on just because uh, people know that the courts are going to expect it. It's in pre-action protocols to talk about it. So it's on the agenda. Gone are the days when the week before trial, um, people would start thinking, have you heard of ADR? Um, although it surprises me how many cases land on my desk to mediate that are the week before trial. Um, and sometimes people need that impetus. Um, there's always a bit more information they need, a bit more disclosure, a few more witness statements in order to be able to make a decision. But earlier the better simply because costs are not such a massive um, issue um the, the deals that we can make i think people realize now that um you can settle um a, a case with a, an outcome that's completely different and putting this in a context of a property dispute did not too long ago where there was a dispute about whether or not there was a a, a nuisance between uh being um perpetrated on a particular property owner and the deal they ended up was that uh, that the uh, defendant bought the claimant's property at over market value um, which they could never have achieved at court and if either one of them had discussed this as a possibility with their lawyers beforehand they'd have thought it was fanciful so there are massive opportunities um, I've talked about cost savings from getting in early um, and the great thing about I think particularly remote mediation is this business about actually clients don't always want to be involved in litigation. Um, I find that a bit odd, but um, they sometimes want to get on and earn their money doing their job. So, um, you know, this is a process where 
uh, especially if, the, if it's remote, they can actually be thinking about other things um, as well as mediation. Um, and as I said, I, I think that that is a, uh, a, real, uh, a real selling point for, for clients that sometimes as lawyers we can lose sight of because we think it's a really interesting case and it's important to be heard in court. But actually the truth is most clients are only coming to their lawyers because they want not to be in dispute rather than because they want to be in dispute. So those I think are just my brief um, uh, my brief touch on the um, on the benefits um, and the advantages of, of, of mediation for parties. Um, and I now want to move on to my next uh, slide, um, which is about managing stakeholders. I'm going to just look at this from the context of what stops this type of uh, dispute from settling. And I think one of the real issues sometimes is that actually you get to the doors of settlement and suddenly they realize, oh, hang on, we need landlord's consent. Um, oh, we'll, we'll get that, I'm sure. And so you end up with a settlement agreement that is subject to consent to assign or is subject to some other some other issue the case that i just mentioned that where you had somebody actually buying a property there were all sorts of considerations well how actually are you going to do that are you going to have a binding um you know they, they effectively you know, exchange contracts on a sale of uh, of land um and those sort of considerations um were really important that all the right stakeholders were there in order to make those uh, decisions or at least thought about um, where for example you, I saw a lot of 32% um, uh, um, service charge disputes um, when sometimes the dispute uh, isn't really with the um, level of service charge it's with the fact that what the managing agent is doing isn't pressing all the right buttons uh, and so if you turn up with a mediation between a landlord and a, a, a tenant um, without the, the, the key um, important person being the managing agent in those cases, you really put yourself at a disadvantage to getting a deal because it's all right blaming somebody who's not at the table, but if they're not there, then they can't participate. And very often they have information that when explained will really enable the parties then to say, well, OK, now I understand why that's the case let's move on and we can come up with something more constructive going forward so i think for me it's about making sure who needs to be there in order to do the deal uh, and i think the flip side of it is actually working out who perhaps isn't going to help um, when we're looking at things like delapse claims um, it's easy to have a mediation taken over by one expert that reckons the cost of a new roof is half a million and the other one that reckons actually can put a bit of gaffer tape on and or stop the leaks and it'll all be fine those they're never going to agree and so one needs to work out whether their um, involvement is something that perhaps should be dealt with separately or maybe have without prejudice meetings but for the commercial decision making of a mediation you probably you need the key parties there which is probably the landlord um and uh, and the tenant in those circumstances um so i'm conscious i could talk about this all day and i think really the key thing for me today is people have a chance to ask questions of us um rather than hear what we think um because uh, and i'm particularly quite interested to hear what what other people think of the things that block settlement and the opportunities there might be to uh, to, to get around them. So um, I think if that works with Laura and, and Eve, whether we now move on to um, Eve's, um, who's going to talk about uh, some of the key areas of dispute with me. And the first of those is the breach of contract. So Eve's going to talk about that. 
Thank you, Stephen. Um, well, yes, I mean, that's a very, very big bucket, isn't it? And um, hence, I, I noticed that I think 89 or, or a very, very high percentage of you have been involved in these. And I suppose it, it really, not, not to go into professional negligence, which comes at the end, it, but it, it, it spans everything, doesn't it? From the actual building and development and design stage through to running a commercial property and all of the problems that can arise in relation to that, whether it's between the landlord and the tenant through the managing agents, or whether it's through um, defects and, and therefore through the leases. So it's a very, very broad bucket. Um, but what, what is what I would I'll just emphasize what Stephen was saying earlier, which is the, the role of the mediator really is to work with the representatives to think about who will best help on the day. Um, and I quite agree with Stephen that you don't necessarily need, you know, a whole string of experts. But if one side is going to bring that expert in, in one particular field, you do want that to be balanced, you're probably going to want to help the other side do the same. So you want balance, you want it to be able to be workable. These, um, these mediations sometimes can involve quite a few people and that can make the actual um, framing of the day to make it as efficient as possible quite challenging. Um, and we work with the representatives ahead of time to make sure that we've structured the mediation day to take, to take account of that. Um, there are um, a lot of uh, mediations around the, the disputes over fees, whether it's the managing agent's fees um, levied through the service charge, the difficulty of managing agents entering into individual disputes with a tenant under one lease in a multi-occupancy, possibly multi-purpose um, development, and where that leaves the managing agent's ability to recover costs when service charges are in, only properly recoverable against the uh, the charges that are properly imputed on the individual uh, premises and demises in the, in, in the property. So there's lots of lots of areas of ramification within that. Um, but on the whole, um, it, it's it's an area which um, enables, uh, what I, I think, really benefits from the creativity of mediation. You can find creative, pragmatic outcomes, which perhaps litigation is a bit of more of a blunt tool and and, and would sort of have one direction, whereas mediation, provided it's lawful, you can bring whatever is, is, is practicable in. Shall I hand over to you, Stephen, to talk about breach of covenant? Yeah, thanks a lot, um, Eve. The, um, I think with breaches of covenant, it's it, a lot of the time you're thinking, well, what actually does the party want here? You know, they're saying the other party's in, in breach. Um, and obviously, there's covenant to pay rent, which is quite plain that they want to be paid but um, if for example uh, you have a, a, a covenant like um, it will not use a building for a particular purpose and um, you, you do actually question is there is there actually something that somebody wants out of this do they actually want the person to go do they want them to stop operating as an off license when um, that they're the purpose of the covenant in the first place may have been to have only one off license in a block or none because they had a religious um, observance issue. If actually the real question is that a party is perhaps hanging a claim on a breach, but actually there's something else um, beneath it. The great thing about mediation is the mediator can work with parties to work out really what they do want. Um, you know, are they looking for some sort of financial compensation to change the terms of the lease, or are they looking for something, um, uh, you know, more, you know, more draconian? Are they actually looking for some sort of injunction where they say, "That thou shalt not"? Um, and I think once you really understand it and get under the skin of what a party um, is is looking for, uh, then settlement is is much more likely. Um, one thing you can't do is change who your opponent is um you know if you have uh, a, an opponent that is a a, a, a serial uh, contract breaker there's nothing in the mediation process that will change it or if you go to court that will change it so perhaps the best thing to do is to try and work out actually is there some sort of route that we can all be perfectly happy with um and i think generally speaking um a landlord is going to be happier with somebody um, paying rent um, than having a, a void period. So um, if there is a, 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 a 
very significant breach, well, maybe then they do want to terminate and uh, forfeit the lease. But I think the key is for the parties to turn up really understanding what they really want, um, especially when it comes to this type of uh, area of dispute. So I don't think that was actually anything more than waffle. I apologise if it was. Um, shall I speak a little bit about dilapidations claims because um, th that's an area also where I think um, mediation has been proven to be really very useful again because it takes this pragmatic holistic approach. Um, obviously the first place to start is the pre action protocol for damages in, uh, in relation to condition of commercial property at the termination of a tenancy and what that calls for is a, a level of transparency and early disclosure for the parties to be able to create perhaps a Scott schedule compared with looking at sort of the, the condition of the property at the end of the term of the uh, tenancy with the schedule of condition when the, at the time the tenant picked it up. And then, of course, the, there's a big debate over what is fair wear and tear and what has actually been a, a dilapidation for which um, the uh, landlord can seek, can seek damages. Um, so because these cases are very evidence rich and there will be endless expert reports and um, Excel spreadsheets with, which go on for ages, those are actually very expensive to take to court typically, uh, certainly for, for the bigger claims. Um, and therefore, again, very, very useful to use mediation for that. And what I have seen in cases of that nature is you can also chunk it out. So you can separate out, it's possibly it's a mediation which takes place over one or two or three meetings where you deal with different sort of sections of the Scott schedule and then you bring it all together at the end. Um, and that enables you to bring the right experts to the day, not waste the party's costs bringing all of the experts into the same mediation when only they're only going to speak to one element of the claim. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's an area which uh, is very well, I think mediation is very helpful because it enables everybody to roll up their sleeves and just take a really pragmatic approach to it and look at it against litigation risk. And, and again, as Stephen, you hinted at earlier, again, it's the litigation costs in this, the cases of this nature, which might well be a very strong incentive for the parties to, to engage in mediation. Over to you, Stephen. Thanks. I, um, I, th I think the point about the um the amount of work in some of these disputes is uh, is probably not lost on on the lawyers um and sometimes the clients may not always get the amount of cost they've got going um in in front of them and i do think the reality testing of the mediation process sometimes makes people think well perhaps i'm being right is actually overrated in this case and it's um it's not so important and i think when you come to forfeiture cases, um, it's a bit of a binary outcome for um, uh, which you might think on the face of it doesn't lend itself to settlement and doesn't lend itself to mediation. Either a landlord wants to get rid of a, a, a tenant or, or they want them to, to stay. But sometimes the mediation can get to the underlying problem. Um, I have an example of this is a, a COVID related um, problem with a call centre that during the process of COVID, the call centre had um, set itself up for all of its staff to work from home and had spent a lot of money on software to enable to do that. At uh, the time that they could come back to the office, um, they could see no real benefit. They expected the landlord um, uh, uh, to just accept the fact that, um, uh, I think there was where they need to share the pain from the landlord's point of view, they actually thought, I need to have my rent paid for the, um, the period of the, of the, the lease. Uh, and that sort of um, dispute is extremely hard for parties to um, come away with any sense that they've got satisfaction as in a, a fair outcome. Um, the reality, I think, with a lot of cases of that nature, it's going to be painful for one or both parties, but the real advantage of, of, of sitting down and talking is trying to work out what the underlying problems are. And so if it's a case of saying, well, if you can get your rent back on, on track, um, uh, then maybe we'll give you a longer period of the lease. Um, and Actually, if the true underlying position is the business doesn't need that building anymore, as was the call centre situation, then actually the mediation process was able to flush that out, which made a 
um, enable the parties to actually work out how they were going to resolve it and how they were going to settle it. Um, but it also needed part of the lawyers there with a very good understanding of what the law was, um, which may sound obvious, but isn't always um, the case. So um, the same forfeiture case is, it, it, don't, don't think just because it's a potentially binary outcome, there isn't a benefit in getting, uh, uh, getting before a mediation. I should have said Eve. <laughs> I switch myself off. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, professional negligence, again, a very big bucket. Um, so, you know, it, it can be, you know, claims brought against the architects at the beginning and or the designers at the very beginning of a project, which is usually a good thing. What, what's less helpful is when you find these latent defects or, you know, valuation issues which have, you know, which only come out very much later. Um, what, what, one interesting feature, I think, of commercial property uh, in particular in relation to professional negligence are the kinds of things which come up which were not possible to envisage at the outset. The nature of uh, some of these um, developments, if you want, where you only everything is set out, the funding has been secured on the basis of a certain scope of works which looks sensible, which has some you know, sensible prelims in it and some sensible sort of areas where some some um, areas for, uh, you know, possible unknowns uh, have been accounted for. And then you come across an archaeological find, as, as was the case in one of the cases I worked on, and, and that suddenly everything grinds to a halt. And whose fault was it? Who should have found out about it? Who didn't carry out the correct searches? Um, so it's, it, it's an area which there obviously, again, uh, pre-action protocols which encourage the parties to be as transparent early on about uh, sharing information which can help both sides assess their litigation risk, assess the claim and therefore um, make informed decisions on the day to try to reach a commercial, uh, a commercial resolution. I would come back to the point that was made earlier about the benefit of mediation being a practical tool which, uh, and I should say, and I'm sure Lauren will touch on this, but absolutely the great majority of mediations settle and they settle on the day or very shortly thereafter and the benefit of that is that if you've got an ongoing relationship in a landlord and tenant situation or an ongoing relationship because you've got a commercial property development construction project afoot actually being able to restore that relationship and get back to to, to running or developing the property is is hugely beneficial. Um, just one small point to, to say to those of you who are less experienced with mediation, one aspect of professional negligence which will be relevant is probably uh, finding out who the insurers are for the defendants, making sure they're either present on the day if the claim is significant enough or at least available at the end of the phone, because in fact they will be driving the mediation because they will be, they'll be the decision makers because they have to put their hands in their pocket. So that's something worth thinking about ahead of time. As mediators offering to speak to the insurer to make sure they've got everything that they need to assess the claim they probably do they're very very experienced obviously in the time to use mediation and 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 how they've assessed the claim, the claim. I, I think i'll hand over to you lauren but there's, um, there's plenty more that we could say which but i i, I like stephen we'll leave that to questions i think great thank you very much eve could we go to the next slide so we're now going to look at recent developments in in mediation and probably the the two biggest areas and one doesn't seem very obvious because it's an arbitration act but is the 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 sort of discussion in relation to mandatory mediation which is what i'm going to touch on first and then looking at the commercial rents uh, coronavirus arbitration act which many of you will be familiar with um so in terms of mandatory mediation um it previously was felt by the courts and, and there was a court of appeal judgment um, in Halsey, which said that it was not compatible with the Article 6 of the ECHR. Um, and that has now been sort of turned on its head. So uh, about June of last year, so literally a, a year ago, um, the Civil Justice Council uh, published a report uh, it, which looked at the essentially sort of two aspects of mediation, which is the legality of it, um, and the desirability of it in terms of bringing in either mandatory or compulsory mediation, however you want to refer to it. Um, and essentially where, where the, the CJC came out is that they thought it was compatible with Article 6 and so that therefore there is no legal block. And that provided that there are certain conditions met in relation to um, 
bringing in compulsory mediation, that it would be desirable to do so. Um, so suddenly there was a lot of interest in uh, compulsory mediation. And so what we've seen is that has really built over the past year. So in August of last year, the um, Ministry of Justice launched a call for evidence in relation to uh, alternative dispute resolution and the way it's used. Uh, and a lot of that was focused on mandatory mediation. There was a report published off the back of that um, and there's still further work which is being carried out in relation to that. Um, and so what we see it as at CEDAR is really the, the door to compulsory mediation has been firmly opened and is now being explored. Um, and there's a question as to, you know, there's a ton of questions as to how it would work, at what phase would it be brought in, um, how are, how is the, the profession regulated, things like that. And those are all the aspects that will need to be sort of bottomed out, but it, it's quite an interesting period um, for mediation. And if you couple that with uh, sort of two things. So one is we've really seen post pandemic, a big increase in, in interest in mediation. Um, and as Stephen touched on an in interest in pre action mediation. So a lot of parties are interested in at least getting around the table at the beginning stages of their dispute, whether they're represented or unrepresented, there's a real mix um, and having a chat about a way forward before they then sort of hit hit the, the no turning back button of litigation. Um, so, you know, we really see that as a positive thing. It, it results in a, usually in a settlement, our settlement rates are about 85% uh, for, for full day mediations. Uh, that can change when you, you have sort of um, reduced time mediations, uh, such as three hours or four hours. But if you give it a full day, you're, you're looking at 70, 70 to 75% settle on the day with a further sort of 10 to 15 um, within two weeks after. So. The statistics are, are very uh, in favor of mediating um, and show that the parties uh, do follow through with their agreements, which is great. Um, in addition to sort of the increased interest in mediation in the CJC report, what we've also seen, and, and, and many of you will be familiar with this, is the master of the roles has been giving a number of talks in which he has talked about uh, NDR, which is nego negotiated dispute resolution, or dropping the A in DR, in ADR, so that it's just dispute resolution mechanisms, uh, and seeing it much more as sort of a holistic part of a system. So he is clearly very much a proponent of mediation and other um, negotiated dispute resolution mechanisms, but also adjudication, um, and expert determination, those aspects, things that are really, you have a number of tools in your belt, and it's really about seeing which one is fit for the dispute that you have on your desk. Um, or that you are a party to. So it's very much sort of a watch this space, but there has been obviously a, a big development with essentially a departure from the, the Halsey decision of the Court of Appeal. Uh, that then brings me on to the Commercial Rent Coronavirus Arbitration Act of this year. Um, so again, as, as many of you will be aware, there was a moratorium on, um, at, on enforcement claims in relation to certain rents, uh, certain rent debts uh, that were accrued during the closure periods um, as a result of coronavirus. And it, it depends, the reason I can't give you specific dates is it depends on the industry because they were lifted at different times for different industries, such as gyms or um, restaurants, things like that. And so that existed until the 24th of March this year. And then the Commercial Rent Coronavirus uh, Act Arbitration Act came into force and it is enforced for the next six months uh, from March till September. And essentially what it provides for is for protected rents, which is, are, are rents that were accrued during the defined period of closures for the relevant industry. Um, it provides that essentially you can't march off the court just yet uh, to, to, to go and enforce those if there's a debt, but rather you can use this arbitration scheme. Um, and the arbitration scheme is, is not uh, you're not looking at a, a sort of legal right. So this isn't about whether the debt is due under the, under the lease, but rather you're looking at equitable relief. So you the powers under the act are they can, debt can be written off, interest can be written off, or the time for repayment can be extended for up to two years. Um, and so either the tenant or the landlord can bring an action under the act and it will be determined, it's a, it's a pretty quick process. Um, 
but what we have seen from at least from what, what we have seen within the sector is that there hasn't been a big uptick just yet in those types of cases um but that could be because people are negotiating them at the moment and they have until september to then bring them so you know it, it is something to to bear in mind i think the one thing that the act definitely envisions and if you read any of the the government material that's been released on this is it very much encourages parties that this should be used as a last resort you really should be speaking to each other you should be talking to each other about your ability to pay you should be talking to each other about your ability to extend terms and to find commercial resolution um, because ultimately the best result for both parties is if the tenant can trade out and if the um, landlord can keep its tenant <laughs> and so that is very much what it, it looks it looks towards and there's a code of practice of what, as well in relation that applies um, so those are all things to sort of keep in mind as we, we run into the summer and then that will continue as I said until September and then that will come to an end towards the end of September um, so that that is where we get to on recent developments. Um, so I would now encourage we're now going to move sort of to questions and I'd encourage you to, to keep putting your questions into the, the questions box and, and we will put those to uh, to the panel essentially. Um, so as a, as a first question, what we have is um, and Eve, I'm, I'm going to field this to you, although there's no there's no um, real um, magic to this uh it's probably going to be sort of every other one but um is are there any commercial property disputes that are not suitable for mediation oh that, that's an interesting question um i i can't really think uh, i mean i can't really think of many um i think where where things can get tricky is when you work with the public sector for example, because the public sector have very clear parameters within which they can negotiate. And sometimes they're simply just not in line with the expectations of the commercial uh, stakeholders, be it insurers or, or claimants of another nature. So I think they're a particular, uh, they're in a particular world of their own and, and, and something which the mediator has to sort of make sure that the mediation is actually gonna be valuable. If there is no chance of finding a commercial settlement on the day, our role is not to press for mediation if it's not likely to succeed because mediations are actually very expensive for the part. I mean, they're relatively inexpensive compared to litigation possibly, um, but you still have situations where you're bringing potential counsel experts and others to the day. So um, I, would, I would keep that in mind. Um, I don't know, Stephen, have you got any other ideas? No, I, well, I, I always think that things are, you know, it's always worth talking. Um, and uh, if the alternative is court, um, I, I, my experience is that people end up talking at some stage, just having spent a lot more money to make their point. Um, and I think sometimes when people are thinking there's no point in mediating, um, it, it's making an assumption that they know what the other side thinks. Uh, my experience, I'm sure, is the same as yours, that in almost in every case, they're not quite right on that. And that the other side may have a different agenda. Um, and so just finding out about that and talking is, it's gotta be a good thing. Uh, even if you take your view that the mediation is not gonna necessarily get to a settlement, what you learn, from the process is more likely to give you the tools then to go on and settle that's my that that's my additional point on that that's really helpful and and eve you really focused on authority um to what extent should and this is going to come on to the next question which i i have, have in the background um but is to what extent do parties need to really focus on looking at that authority point and what do they need to do to address it in advance of the mediation? Um, well, no, it, it's very important, of course. Um, so uh, in any in, uh, mediation, of, in, in any uh, discipline, you need to make sure that you've got the decision makers there. And um, nothing is more frustrating than when people say they're coming with authorities to settle and then you find that they've got you know, parameters which were simply just not realistic. Uh, we all know that at mediation, people come with certain expectations and 
if it's going to succeed, you're probably not going to be settling within your the expectations that you'd set yourself. You're going to have to push those. So you do absolutely need to have the right people there. Um, and so, for instance, you know, um, I've seen some interesting cases where the tenants will get together and and um, bring an action potentially against the managing uh, company, the managing agent company. Managing agent company may, by the way, also be formed of tenants, which can make it uh, an interesting uh, sort of uh, situation because these are people who are actually living in the same building or, or working in the same building. Um, but in those instances, it's not just the managing agents who are going to be able to uh, settle this. They will probably need to have access to the insurers, to the landlord. Um, and these things are not always easy to arrange. And all you don't want to find is that you're at that mediation and you have to amend terms of the lease. Only the landlord can do that. And the landlord happens to be a Qatari based company with no representatives in the UK for that day. So it's very much about sort of peeling under the skin of what's actually going on during the preparation stage before the mediation to see who might best be present to not just make the decisions, but also provide the relevant information to the decision maker to be able to assess whether it's a claim or, or, or what the nature of the, of the issue might be. That's really helpful. And now, Stephen, I'm, I'm going to ask you a related question, which is, what sort of if you had to give three tips to someone what would be the the three tips you would give them in terms of effectively preparing for a mediation well think of it put yourself in the other side's shoes what is it that the other side will need to know in order to either agree with you or move towards you and so um at one extreme was the case of um that, that somebody had had a fire um, that had um, destroyed the fish and chip shop um, with all of the brand new equipment that was in it um, and there was an itemized list of the cost of all this the thing they didn't have were any documents to support the numbers and it, you know with hindsight it's pretty obvious that they were going to ask to see some sort of proof that those figures were um, were, were correct um, and so I think it's just thinking what's the other side going to want to see and again you see it with things like where people are saying well we just can't afford to pay what they're asking for um if that's your bargaining position well you need to put some thought into how you're going to persuade them and it may be that you need to say well here's a statement of assets and you know this is we've lost our contracts and here's some proof of our here are bank statements showing things so and also being ready to deal with difficult points um I don't think you're ever going to get a deal that you like if you're trying to avoid the elephant in the room um, that may be a difficulty in your case or um, maybe a, a, a legal argument that it, it, you, you're saying, well, I don't want to talk about the law. This isn't a day for law. And I've said that so many times. It's, you know, it's a day for clients, not lawyers. But sometimes the law is important. And so not being prepared for that can cause a a problem so i would say i've noticed we've got some questions um one of which is addressed to me what do you want me to do, do you want me to come back on to that later or shall i touch on it if you could touch on it now that'd be great yeah i i, I will this is from peter uh higgins a couple and I, I in a way they're linked together peter's questions were whether there's an extremely stubborn landlord an extremely strong position well funded, no need to settle watertight contract. Have you found these hard to move on, um, or have you found particular tactics that have helped move such cases on? Which links directly to his other question, which is what was the trigger point um, on the call centre settlement? I think sometimes it's about, uh, Peter, it's about getting people to understand the reality of the situation that they're in. If they believe themselves to be right and very often they are going to be in the right you know the um, uh, the call center was a case of them realizing that their strategy um to get all the money that was due to them and keep the landlord ticking along and they were very well funded and could go all the way that strategy was never going to get them whatever they wanted because they're going to be irrecoverable legal costs and the chances are the uh, I mean the the company 
the defendant company, the, the tenant, was in the travel industry, which has had a ridiculously hard time over the last few years. So the chances are they weren't going to be around if to to pay any significant claim. And so I think it was a question of just realizing, you know, as I say, waking up and smelling the coffee and realizing that actually they're better off doing a deal that appears very generous but reflects a better outcome quickly and they can move on and i think there is the reality is that they've got a massive problem and the fact is to say no it's not my problem it's the it's the um other uh, it's the other it's the tenant's problem because my contract's watertight and the lease is watertight and they've got to pay me but actually it's their problem because they want to be paid they want payment to um they want to get some money and so they need to try and work out a way that that's going to happen and get the best outcome that they can they can manage so uh, and i think you know being being right isn't you know really isn't everything um and you know it's sort of just there's a hog hog <laughs> too much time so i'm conscious of it passing by but it's so easy for a, a landlord to say well you know there's an obligation to put property in good repair you've not done so you know this is my massive claim but um actually what what is you know what what, what is the um you know what what is the benefit of insisting on being right um and very often it's not that great really um and if there's a perception that the landlord's been particularly harsh or unfair then th that mitigates against a settlement if you're basically just saying with a gun to your head pay up um most people don't feel like getting a checkbook out in those circumstances unless it is a gun in which case they might but um they're more like to phone the police i'd have thought so anyway that's my take for what it's worth um peter um and i'm just going to say to lauren here that the little um box at the right hand corner of your questions thing if you click that they come up now we've, we've just got we've got another question that's come in so eve i'm, I'm going to ask you to respond to this one which is do you think that the commercial property industry has its own culture or psyche compared say to the insurance market or finance markets which is reflected in the character of the disputants which mediators need to be aware of or is it just the same as any sector I think that's an excellent question, I have to say. Um, there's two things that come to my mind. Um, one is the nature of um, high-end commercial property in this country, um, well, certainly in London, in my experience, um, is that a lot of it is foreign-owned. And um, and so there's some real cultural, uh, I've come across some sort of very different cultural uh, approaches, if you want, to, to disputes and, and, and to mediation. And I think that's something which is particular to this field, which is worth being mindful of. And, and I think uh, is something which CEDA would be very attuned to pairing the right mediator to the dispute, if you want. But the other, the other thing which comes to mind, it's a little bit like construction. I would say it tends to be quite sort of um, quite aggressive, uh, quite positional. Um, quite litigious and um, before you know it, the costs get in the way of being able to get things back on track. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's high emotion very often because people are invested in assets for which they want to get a yield unless the, the dispute is getting in the way of that. Um, so it, it'll be multi-party probably in terms of the, the experts that are going to be brought to these kinds of uh, dispute and 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 perhaps quite sort of aggressive and and you know one of the roles of the mediators to um, deal with all of that in the preparation get people to feel that they've said their bit so that when they come on the day there's already a plan to start moving forwards great and Stephen, did you have anything that you wanted to to add to that point oh i think you're on mute <laughs> You're Please don't remind me again. The little thing is, I always remind me. Um, yeah, I, I, I think also there's. I think one of the things about it is that, that with amongst the lawyers, um, it's like if you do professional negligence work. All professional negligence lawyers talk the same language, and I think that's another thing. If you're involved in the property sector, very frequently there's a shorthand, and so 
it just makes um, it makes it easier for the parties when everybody just can cut to the chase and understand what's going on. But I also think for a mediator, I'm sure Eve and Lauren would agree, you've got to take each case as a separate case because you just don't know whether the personalities involved will be, you know, will have something about them that you, you know, it's going to take you by surprise. So um, I always look at the beginning part on that set of slides that um, Eve had up um, about the process. For me, the early parts of mediation is just trying to understand the people and get to know them uh, and um, and then perhaps putting a gloss over it that is in a particular industry but it's actually what makes this person tick what's going to make them want to do a deal and um, because there's nothing no point in pressing the wrong buttons and um, as I've learned to my cost <laughs> Great, and then we have a, an, another question which is coming, which I think is actually more probably for me, which is, does Cedar have any insight on whether deal mediation, that is front end mediation, where the mediator is involved in the negotiation process to help the negotiators overcome tricky points and get the deal over the line if it's emerging? Um, and the, the answer there is we are seeing mediation used a lot more now in a whole myriad of, the mediation skills used in a whole myriad of situations whether that is facilitations between you know, shareholders or um, unions uh, in terms of, of at the negotiation stage, or if we're seeing it at the, at the property stage. It's not, but, but I will say this, when those happen at the moment, they are still quite unique. Um, so we're seeing it used more readily, but we're not seeing it used regularly in any given industry um, in the same way that mediation is used in the disputes field. Um, but a lot of that has to do with what we find is the stakeholders are different. So they're not as familiar with mediation. Um, and what'll happen is you'll have someone who has been involved in the dispute, went to a mediation and then says, hey, that person would have been great if we had them at the deal stage. Um, and then they start using them and then they expose people. So we are seeing it, um, but we're not seeing a lot of it. Um, we do think it would be beneficial. I think that you know having a, a third party involved who is able to, as Stephen and, and Eve have both touched upon, who's able to really understand, okay, what is the issue? We always refer to it as kind of an iceberg. So what is the issue that's lurking under the surface and how do we address that? And that doesn't always come across when you're in sort of bilateral discussions, right? You can, you can guess what that is and you can think about what that is, but a mediator can really get to the heart of that and then help the parties be able to address those types of issues through a negotiated uh, deal or, or settlement. So we, we are seeing, so the short answer to your question is we are seeing more of it, but we are not seeing a, a lot of it. Um, I think that is it for us for time. Um, uh, I'd like to thank you uh, on behalf of Stephen and Eve and myself for attending today and for giving us your time. We really hope that you found it useful. Um, the slides will be circulated afterwards. And if you wanna get in touch with Cedar um, or Steve or Eve, or Eve um, in order to ask us some questions, please feel free to use the contact details that are provided. We're happy to answer any questions that you may have in relation to a mediation. It doesn't just have to be that you want to book a mediator through CEDAR. Um, we often get questions and, and we're happy to have a discussion with you uh, about that. Um, and so we look forward to hopefully hearing from you and good luck. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.